we are live good evening all and a very good afternoon to those here in close to the north pole today on i focus online the 373rd episode 48th on the oculoplasty module we have an international master class by dr david verity from moorfields eye hospital london uk to speak to us on vascular tumors of the orbit dr verity is trained in ophthalmology in the uk and fellowships in ocular plastics is a consultant to moorfields eye hospital since 2004 In 2009 he was elected to the Orbital Society and between 2011 and 2018 was the editor in chief of the journal Orbit. He has 110 publications to his credit, is an active national international teacher and a surgical trainer himself. He was the president of the British Society of His Specialty from 2019 to 2023, treasurer of the European Society of Ophthalmic Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery. co-editor of the society's forthcoming comprehensive textbook iris fund millennial award in 2000 for research into the causes of blindness was awarded to him in 2015 he founded the st john's ophthalmic association a postgraduate organization to support the hospital and unify the healthcare experts across the world of st john and established the iface.net work in 2022 it's a pleasure to have you sir on our platform over to you for tonight's lecture Thank you very much indeed. So it's a great pleasure to be here. And uh, I think hopefully you're going to be able to see my screen. Uh, someone give me a thumbs up. You got a thumbs up. That's great. So um, I was taught by a colleague who said, if you find something difficult, give a talk on it. Because when you give a talk, you have to understand the basics. And from that, you can then build your understanding of the pathology of the disease and how to treat it. So all of us here can go to a textbook and we can just read up on orbital vascular disease. You can do that this evening if you like. But it's only the patients that we have coming through our clinics that teach us what we need to know and which patients to operate on and which patients not to operate on and how diseases of the orbit vascular disease progress. So this is not going to be a talk that just reiterates the latest textbook. I can send you some chapters from textbooks. What I'm going to do is to use this talk to show you various patients I've had in a logical fashion over the last say 15 years to see how these patients respond to treatment and when to interact and when not. So orbital vascular disease is the overall title. And vascular disease is complicated. That's why I'm giving the talk because we all find this area difficult and every textbook, every generation classifies them in a different way. Now, I've found the most useful way of, of classifying orbital vascular disease is just by pathology. Number one, we've got the benign growths, the hemangiomas. They are actually tumors, but they're benign. Hemangiomas, those are the common ones in children. Number two, the vascular malformations. Okay, so these are original malformations in the vascular tree. Number three, pretty rare, rare stuff, rare vascular tumors. We won't spend too long on that. And then lastly, just as I'm afraid as we all get older, our blood vessels become less strong or ectatic. Uh, so those are the four areas we're gonna look at today. This talk will take about 50 minutes uh, and it is a condensation of a lot of the, 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 the work that I put into this and various chapters that I've written with senior colleagues of mine and others, including the great Professor Jeffrey Rose, who you all know, who's taught me most of what I know in this area. And I'm grateful to him for many of the, uh, the concepts that I've learned as well as some of the pictures that I'll be showing in this talk. So that's the classification by pathology. But actually, if you go to the International Society for the Study of Vascular Anomalies, they will classify it by flow type. And you could say that's even easier, or at least less complicated, because there are basically two types, high flow and low flow. And my talk's going to cover all of these types largely by pathology. But bear in mind that there is this society called ISSVA that classifies vascular malformations. And this came out in 2017. So when something in life is complicated and when human biology does not observe clear pigeonholes, you know, nothing is black and white in medicine. It's all a gray area often. Try to keep it simple. And this is a very nice approach you can see on this slide. You've got the high flow and you've got the low flow. And we're gonna cover these and at the end, I'll summarize what we've covered. And of course, this talk will be available afterwards for people to recap uh, if they want to. So let's go to pathology again, hemangiomas. That's the first group that I'd like to look at, chiefly relating, of course, to children. Now, what is a hemangioma? I'm going to assume that I've got all, all grades of colleagues on this call. 
some less experienced, some more experienced. And if this is a little bit basic for some of you, I apologize for the moment. Hemangioma is a benign tumor caused by abnormal growth of blood vessels, mostly on the face and the neck. And of course, we see it around the eye. And some of the books say that they are present at birth, but you and I know that they're not normally present at birth, but they come on soon afterwards in the first month or two of life, but they're not typically actually present at birth. So what we're looking at here, the number one of the hemangiomas is a capillary hemangioma. And this is the one that is present not at birth, but very soon after birth. And in fact, it's the commonest soft tissue tumor of infancy. We don't know what, what it's due to. We don't know the pathology, but there is some suggestion that this is placental origin. In other words, there are placental antigens at play that stimulate the growth of this before it eventually decays, and it does decay. So just bear in mind that it may have something to do with the maternal placenta and some cells that come off the placenta, maybe. But anyway, it's common. 2% of all people are born with some form of capillary, capillary hemangioma. Now on the, on the right, you can see these children, one on the eyelid up here, another one hemifacial around here, another one here just around the brow. This one's a bit more obvious. Uh, this like strawberry nevus, that's another term. But when you've got a patient like this, ask the mother if there's a, a lesion elsewhere, because you can be quite certain that in the year you're gonna come across children where the mother says, ah, oh, there's one on the back, there's one on the arm, there's one elsewhere. Just have a look, you'd be surprised how often you find them. Sometimes they're superficial. This one's very superficial, and sometimes they're a bit deeper, and sometimes they're very deep. So they don't occur at birth, but they do occur within a few months after birth. And of course, the reason to treat these is obviously that we have to prevent amblyopia. Just having a capillary hemangioma, per se, of its own, is not dangerous, unless it's very big. But if it obstructs the visual axis or is anywhere near the pupil, then there's a risk of amblyopia, and that's why we treat them. And we used to treat them with surgery, but of course we don't any longer. Now, what I've learned from this area is that if a tumor is removed and there is any uncertainty about whether it might be an infantile hemangioma, and this is rare, but if there is, the, um, the molecule called GLUT1 or endothelial glucose transport 1, this is a diagnostic marker for infantile hemangioma. And I only learned this myself in recent years, and I'm sure you know about it, but if in doubt, remember GLUT1 is a diagnostic tool that differentiates between hemangiomas, these ones, and other vascular malformations. Now, when you look at these lesions, these capillary hemangiomas, they've got some very high flow in their blood vessels. And I did a number of sit studies about 18 years ago, where we looked at all of these children. These were children that had been looked after in the orbital unit in Moorfields for many years, and they all had had Doppler ultrasound. And you see on the left here, a Doppler ultrasound. And the ultrasound is non-invasive and is a very good way of diagnosing these lesions if you have any clinical doubt. And the reason they're so good is that these ultrasounds, if you look at a certain area, so here is just under the skin, if you look at a vessel and you can do what's called a, a spectral Doppler ultrasound, which looks at the flow in the vessel and the ultrasonographer will put a gate on the, on the vessel here and then you can work out if the blood is flowing and how fast it's flowing. And what's really interesting, if you look at here, if you look at uh, this spectrogram below, look how fast these blood, this blood flow is. This is up to one meter per second almost. And that's about as fast as, as aortic flow. So this is arterial. And they've got these very, very high flow waveforms. And this is absolutely classic of capillary hemangiomas. And that's why having and working with a good ultrasonographer is so helpful. So we did a whole series of these because the question that we wanted to know is, they get bigger in the first two months and then if you read the books, the books say they slowly get better. But what's really interesting is if you look at enough children and you measure the size of these, so the size is the pink on this graph, here's pink, this is the, the volume, they don't actually slowly get smaller. They get a little bit smaller and then they get bigger again and then they get smaller and then they become larger. And they decay very slowly around what we call a harmonic mean. And why is this important? 
it's important because when the parents say to you, we're worried it's got bigger again, you can reassure them by saying, yes, it'll get smaller and a bigger and smaller and bigger and eventually it will go away. And this is a feature that's not generally recognized enough in the literature. We looked at lots of these patients, 40 or 50 or so, and we found this as quite a common trait. And not only was the lesion getting smaller and bigger, but at the same time, the maximum volume, look at this, a maximum volume was also getting bigger and smaller. And there's the decay curve. So the books will tell you that they all decay like that, but it's not true. They actually don't decay like that. They decay with a waveform as like a harmonic uh, exponential decay. And I found that very interesting because what gets in the books sometimes isn't always right. And then it's very hard to disprove it. And that's because it's very hard to write something originally because all of us tend to be derivative. And it's very important to try to get all this new science into the chapters that we write and to displace the old science if it's not always correct. So here you see these oscillations, both in the volume and in the velocity, and they go up and they go down uh, before eventually they decay. But what's interesting is that in some of these children, even as late as uh, 80 months or so down the line, you know, they're six, seven or eight years or older, they still have volume that you can measure. And that's because we had these children, we kept measuring them. So they don't always disappear completely. These capillary hemangiomas leave behind a small residual capillary, uh, it's called a fibro fatty residuum. And we published this now uh, quite a long time ago. I was about to say 10 years ago, I look at that time has moved on 2006 already. So there you have the behavior. And I think you may not all know that, but I certainly found it very interesting. So how do we manage them? Well, when I was a, a student um, back in 2000 or so, a lot of these patients were having surgery. And then along came a much better treatment about 10 years later, where beta blockade was found to be really effective, not only systemically, but even as a gel for topical lesions. And I'm very grateful to my colleague, Mr. Yasser Abarai, who's let me use these pictures to, sh to show you how effectively these lesions respond to, in this case, um, systemic propanolol, presumably because they express these beta-2 adrenoceptors on their surface. And so propanolol has really mean that surgery is very rarely performed for these lesions, assuming they need treatment. And that, isn't that an amazing uh, product of modern medicine that these patients can be so effectively treated um, with uh, topical or systemic treatment and no longer need surgery? Now, still on the subject of hemangiomas, this is the first part of, of four of these lesions. The second one is something called intraosseous hemangioma. And I'd be fascinated to know if anybody on this call has ever heard of this or seen one. I've only seen a few. And it's a bit like London buses. If you see one, you see two, and then you see three, like three London buses. They all come in a row. And it was just like that with these patients. These patients have a swelling in the bone, but the swelling is due to a benign intraosseous hemangioma. They don't occur in children generally. They're in patients in their 30s and 40s, tends to be in the midline, pretty rare around the orbit, but they do occur in the frontal area, as you see here, sometimes a bit painful, if it's around the globe, they get uh, double vision and typical CT findings occur. If you look at this, you can see it's called like a honeycomb or a starburst. You know, you've got a central star in the middle here with bursts coming out. And that's a classic feature in these hemangiomas. They're not common, uh, but you will see one I expect in your career once or twice. And if they're going to be excised, well, that's fine, but you have to really consider preoperative embolization because of that risk of intraoperative hemorrhage. So let's look at a few patients and see how these are. For anybody who's not seen one, you'll find this interesting. Here's a patient. I think it was the last, it was the previous patient. Uh, this one here. Uh, here you go. This, this patient. So let's see how he did. Here's his lesion here, right in that frontal area of the bone, pushing apart the diploe of the skull. And here you see it being sized. And that, of course, is not an ocular plastics procedure. Uh, and I'm very grateful uh, to my colleagues who helped write this up, particularly Mem Mr. Memo Manasali, who's a very good maxilla facial surgeon. And he excised this, and we put our series together to try to publish it, just to make the point that these lesions occur both in the frontal area and in the axial skeleton, but also around the eyes. Because this gentleman here, he pitched up with a lesion on the inferior orbital margin. And I understand from the literature that it's quite common. If they occur, that is where they occur. And you can see this lesion here. It's not very obvious, but you can see that bone is expanded. And here we approach it with a lower lid swinging flap. 
this pretty hard lesion that comes out like that. Not quite in one piece, but pretty good like that. And then you can see on the histology, these large vascular spaces, they're very boring. There's not much going on there. We call it histologically bland, endothelial cells, loose fibrous tissue. So that's an intraosseous hemangioma, completely different to capillary hemangioma, but still a benign vascular, uh, uh, benign vascular tumor affecting the orbit. So those are the hemangiomas. Now let's come on to the second area. And this is more difficult. This is the area where it's more difficult. And it's difficult because vascular malformations can be due to lymphatics, they can be due to veins, and they can be due to arteries, and they can be due to combinations of the above. And the classification has been difficult over the years, uh, and they can be classified in different ways. But as usual, we try to keep things simple so that in the clinic, we have a clear idea of what we're dealing with and what the best management will be. So of the vascular malformations, I've divided it into those that are lymphatic and those that are venous. And many times they're a combination. So we call them venous lymphatic. And then there are those that are arteriovenous. And then the last one uh, is something called flammeus nevis, which I'll come on to the end of this section. So let's look at the combination of venous lymphatic malformations. And these are congenital but they may go undetected for years. In fact, they may never be detected or they may be detected coincidentally on orbital imaging. And every single week we see patients, don't we, who've sent to us because they have had a, an MRI for a migraine or some other reason, and we find some other lesion. And that's one of the problems with increased scanning uh, of patients is that coincidentally we find these lesions. So these lesions can be, uh, can be uh, detected uh, at any time. They often occur in patients in their 20s and 30s. They've had lots of previous names. And in medicine, the more names a pathology has, the more confusing it can be, and the less certain we always are about what is, what is the cause of the pathology. And they've been called cystic hygromas. They've been called lymphangiomas. But the current nomenclature is venous lymphatic malformations. Most of them occur in the head and the neck. And depending on where they are and what tissues should be in that structure, they can be called hamartomas or choristomas. And I'm sure there's lots of people on this call listening to this who a little bit like me sometimes can get a little bit confused about what's a hamartoma and what's a choristoma. Okay, so the way, so hamartoma is tissue that should be in that place, but it's disorganized and it's irregular, all right? So lymph channels don't exist in the orbit. So a venous lymphatic malformation of the orbit cannot be a hamartoma. So then it's called a choristoma, all right? So a choristoma is also benign and it's normal tissue, but it shouldn't be in that site. So when you've got a lymphatic lesion in the orbit, that's called a choristoma. And it's just worth reminding oneself the difference between hamartoma and choristoma. So lymphatic malformations, they're abnormal. They've got dead end, end lymphatic channels. The orbit's actually fairly rare, but of course, if you have a big enough catchment area and you run an orbital clinic, you're going to see these coming periodically. And they can have large uh, internal spaces called macrocystic, and they can have small cystic spaces, microcystic. Now, here you see a patient, and I'm very grateful to my uh, good colleague, Professor Ian Hutchinson, for letting me show this patient who had a very, very large um, hemifacial venous lymphatic malformation, very difficult to treat. Fortunately, after the patients that we see don't have anything quite as serious as this. And you can see very, very complex and very demanding surgery to successfully re remove or debulk this particular case. I just show you that to show you how large they can be in the head and neck region. But of course, most of the patients we see are orbital and they can have hemorrhages and they can have hemorrhages when they develop a chest infection quite often. Uh, and that can occur in up to about 10%. I don't know how anybody's obtained that statistic because of course we don't know the patients who don't ever have any problems. But what I can tell you is that this explosive hemorrhage can push the pressure up in the orbit so much that they develop an orbital compartment syndrome with a huge intraorbital pressure and intraocular pressure. And if that doesn't settle on conservative treatment, which might include Darmox and topical antihypertensives, and the patient's sick, so they need antiemetics. If they don't improve, you may need to drain it. 
urgently. And that can be effective for a short time. So the patient on the right is a patient of mine and she was a, a, she is a very active person. She is an, is an athlete uh, and has done very well in the, in the Olympic games on many occasions. And she suffers with this problem and occasionally uh, the lymphoma will bleed. And on one occasion, we had to release the blood because the pressure in the orbit had gone up and we could not control the intraocular pressure. It was up in the 50s. And so we had to go and drain it. And it's not the first time. So that can be effective, aspiration, drainage. That causes a decompression. But of course, the ongoing expectant management of these patients, assuming they need treatment, is sclerotherapy, which I'm not going to say a lot about, but I'll just mention it. So here's another patient uh, who also had a sudden explosive orbital hemorrhage. I remember him very well. He came to clinic uh, and he had this sudden onset of pain and he was so he was very unwell. He was sick in himself and he was lying on the floor and he was he was nauseated and vomiting. And here you see his pictures on the left uh, and you can see that chemosis and proptosis. And on the right side here, I don't know if you can make out, but you get the impression there's been one bleed into the lesion and then there's another bleed. And then right on top of that is a third bleed, the one that just took him over the edge and really put that pressure up. You can see the proptosis there. And so we went in, we had to go in because his pressure was so high. And here you see again, a lower lid swinging flap on the bottom. We've swung the lid, there's the lower malleable paddle retractor, there's the top paddle retractor. And here you see us, we've opened the conjunctiva, we've exposed the lesion. We can't possibly remove it all, but we did aspirate it. And here you see me, uh, having aspirated, taking away some of the lesion. And I think if we're lucky, we've got a scary movie and a film to show you. And this will actually show uh, removing the lesion. I'll take the volume down a bit. And uh, the, the quality is not brilliant, but it's interesting. If you watch the upper lid and the way that changes, I'm opening the lesion here. I've exposed it, just the front end. There's a rush of blood. But if you just look at the lid now at the same time, just look how that lid's coming up as the pressure comes off. Isn't that interesting? Uh, and often they have more than one loculated space. And I was doing this as a young consultant. I think if I was doing it now, I'd have the scissors 90 degrees to that uh, to really just gently open it up. And the patient did very well. Although having said that, three years later, he did come back with a similar presentation uh, because it's very difficult, if not impossible, to remove all of the venous lymphatic malformation. And that's why sclerotherapy uh, is more effective in the long run. So, um, Hey, back to my other patient. And here you see this lady. I mentioned her earlier. This is the athlete. And you can see this, uh, these multiple uh, areas here of venous lymphatic malformation uh, that can be so problematic. Now, it's said that with recurrent bleeds, there is a, like an autosclerotherapy where the inflammation inside the lesion as a result of the bleed means that the lesion collapses on itself eventually and causes less trouble. And it may be true that when patients run into trouble, they tend to be younger rather than older. And perhaps that's because with recurrent bleeds, the lesions collapse on themselves or become fibrosed and therefore cannot expand so much when there is a hemorrhage. So um, they do change in size with infection and inflammation. And don't forget that sometimes they can bleed into channels uh, causing a chocolate cyst, so-called. Uh, and so here you see a patient who's had, and I'm very grateful to Professor Rose uh, for sharing this with me. And he, he's showing us here that the patient has a chocolate cyst, a blood cyst removed at the front, but actually also the patient behind this posteriorly had the lymphatic malformation. So if there's one thing to remember from this particular part of the talk, remember that with the bleeding, they can form these kind of insisted areas called chocolate cysts. Don't think they're true cysts, it's like a blood cyst. So just be aware of that, that they are associated with multiple bleeds. Now, I'm not going to say very much about sclerosing agents, but in essence, the concept of an agent that scleroses and they're used in conjunction often with alcohol is to destroy the endothelial lining so that the lesion collapses on itself uh, and it spares normal tissues because the sclerosing agent is put into the cyst. But it can only be done um, if they do not coexist with our venous or arterial venous malformations because the sclerosing agent, when it's injected, must stay within the lymphatic malformation and it should not uh, be able to drain further downstream or upstream. So it's very important that uh, the correct patients are selected. And there are various different agents that are used for the sclerosing. And we'll look at these just very briefly, but the bleomycin is, is good and that can be used uh, as a dual drug combination with sodium tetradecal sulfate. 
Uh, doxycycline is also used, and so does so is sodium moroate as well. And much of this is actually done by some of our pediatric uh, ophthalmologists uh, or uh, oculoplastic surgeons. I myself don't do much of this, but I, it's important to understand the essentials. And this slide I found helpful. These are the types of agents used. Ethanol, it denudes the endothelium and causes thrombosis. Bleomycin causes DNA damage and a nonspecific inflammatory reaction. Don't forget bleomycin can also be used for uh, uh, periocular tumors as well because of the DNA damage. Sodium tetradecal sulfate is basically like a soap. It causes lipid damage to the vessel wall and, and inflammation. And then there's also doxycycline, which is an extraordinary drug because it has many different uh, actions. But one of them is it inhibits these MMPs, matrix metalloproteinases, and it reduces angiogenesis. So a lot on that slide. But of course, if you're watching this, you can always come back and have a look at that later. Uh, so that's the lymphatic and the venous lymphatic. And there are those that are purely venous, so-called venous malformations, venous vascular malformations, also called a varix. Now, we all know about these because what do we do when we see the patient? We ask them to lean forwards, don't we? Or the patient will tell you that when they're straining or they put the pressure up in the head, it gets bigger. So here's a lady on the right. Nothing to see really, is there? Perhaps there's a lump here, a lesion, a fullness. But when she leans down or strains, you can see it becomes more evident. That's a very small one. And again, these are congenital malformations. They're not tumors. They're not hemangiomas. They're just congenital lesions poorly defined venous channels, they grow with the, the patient. They're not tumors, they just grow with the child and they're all low flow and low pressure and they get bigger uh, with the Valsalva, but they can cause a lot of proptosis. And when you look at the scans, you will often see phleboliths, which are absolutely classic in this condition. And as I mentioned, uh, we tend to call them varices, but their proper name is a venous vascular malformation. And interestingly, it's well worth looking at the hard palate of the mouth. This gentleman had suffered uh, uh, with this particular condition and also suffered with lesions in the hard palate, as you see here. Uh, and, and this is the globe as well. And these are very, very difficult to treat because of the, you know, the, the trauma that uh, uh, can be caused when patients eat uh, and the bleeding that can ensue. Very, very hard to treat. And I suppose we're waiting for some form of magic bullet or a monoclonal antibody that recognizes something abnormal in these endothelial cells uh, to close them down, but we're not there just yet. So here's the imaging that I mentioned. Here's an ultrasound that shows these patchy, serpiginous areas here, here, more over here. And here are the phleboliths that we can see. One, two, three, four, five. There's plenty of them. There's many more. It's like shot right through. It's like lead shot right through the lesion. And as far as I'm aware, there's very else, little else that actually looks like that. If you do an MRI, here you see here, a hyperintense lesion, and that's fairly characteristic. So, and here you see such a lesion that's removed. There's the phlebolith, and there's the rest of the lesion, venous vascular malformation. So how to treat them? Well, they can be quite difficult to treat unless they're fairly localized. They're difficult because it's hard to remove all of it. They're difficult to manage because there is the significant risk of hemorrhage. Here on the right, you see some well-defined lesions that are amenable to resection. This one here, for example, amenable to resection. Uh, this one partially amenable. And this one is a group of vessels over the episclera, which may be amenable to resection. And that can be done for aesthetic reasons. And naturally, of course, choose hypotensive anesthesia. And these days, you would also elect to use tranexamic acid, which is a very safe drug which means that when a clot is formed, uh, it, it is no longer dissolved. So tranexamic acid we use with all of our lacrimal patients now, and as you'd certainly consider it in these patients. Now, I have no experience of this last uh, point here, but it is said that interoperative embolization with NBCA can also help. But I think the message is conservative treatment where possible, just because it is problematic in clearing these lesions. Now, when they exist as a solitary form, they are called solitary encapsulated venous lymphatic malformation. We, of course, typically call this a cavernous hemangioma, but it's not actually a hemangioma because a hemangioma implies that it's a neoplasm, a benign neoplasm, which it is not, right? So again, this is a vascular malformation 
And if it's if it's a solitary one, as you see here, they're called solitary encapsulated venous lymphatic malformations. But we all call it cavernous hemangio, and I expect that term will stick. And they become more apparent in the fourth and fifth decades. Uh, I've never seen a bilateral one in the orbit. I'm sure they might exist. They tend to be unilateral. They're often intraconal, uh, and they are also a developmental hamartoma, not a choristoma, but a hamartoma because the the tissue is present in the orbit. If it was uh, so that so that the venous tissue is present in the orbit. Now, don't forget we mentioned earlier if you want to differentiate a vascular malformation of any sort from a capillary hemangioma, we use GLUT1. Now, in this case, it's obvious that this is not a capillary hemangioma, but in other cases you may want to send a specimen off and ask for GLUT1 and Lewis Y, and these will be negative in cavernous hemangiomas. And don't forget that really the important differential with this case is a solitary fibrous tumor because they can look quite similar on scans. And that is exactly why if you have a patient, even if they're asymptomatic and you'll think you're dealing with a cavernous hemangioma, keep a watch on them for a while to ensure it's not changing, to ensure we're not dealing with a solitary fibrous tumor. I digress slightly, but it is an important point that. And what these lesions do, being intraconal, they can push on the back of the eye, shortening the AP length of the eye, as you can clearly see down here. Look at this eye really effectively being impacted by this lesion. And when it does that, what happens to the choroid? Well, the choroid becomes crinkled, but like a tin roof, it becomes crinkled. And you can see, and it, you can see these lines here, and these are called choroidal folds. And the big question we don't have the answer to yet is what happens if you take this tumor away? Do the choroidal folds go away? We don't know the answer to that. And the other question is, well, when should you operate? Because removing these has a risk. It has a risk of temporary or permanent blindness, as we all know. And there's no easy answer to that. But if they're progressive, which a proportion of them can be, then the, you will come to the point where with gradual loss of vision, we, you realize that this lesion is getting larger and actually starts to pose a risk to the optic nerve and to the vision. And at that point, a decision is made to remove the lesion. But if on the other hand, it is identified coincidentally and the patient has a full visual field and full color appreciation, and good movement, there is no need to remove these apart from just to watch them conservatively and only operate if there's evidence for progression with the various metrics that you're using to monitor the patient. So here you have a much smaller example. Uh, this one was managed with uh, intact excision, as you see here. Uh, and But we would do it with the larger ones if they had a visual decline or choroidal folds, because that tends to reduce the vision down to 612 or worse. I'm going to show you this case now. This was a medical colleague of ours from another country, and he was a medical ophthalmologist. Uh, and um, uh, a very busy cataract surgeon and needed his stereopsis. And he presents with this lesion in the orbit here, which radiologically does look like a cavernous hemangioma. Here you see it right up. And in fact, it's been there a while. Just bear with me. You can probably see there's a bit of scalloping of the bone there. Can you see that? You see that bone that's just very slightly scalloped? So it's been there a while. We know that. But obviously, it's starting to get a bit larger and it's starting to progress a bit, getting fuller with blood. And so given that his color appreciation was beginning to drop and his visual fields were impacted, we undertook here, a, a, I'm not showing you the surgery, but we undertook a, a lateral orbitotomy and we drilled the bone back as far as we could so that we could get good access to it. And we compressed this lesion away from the optic nerve and very, very slowly removed it. And mercifully, he kept his full vision and was able to carry on uh, as an ophthalmologist. Um, not an easy case. And there you see the pathology again, uh, no evidence of malignancy in these large empty spaces like that. A cavernous hemangioma, which you now know is called a solitary encapsulated venous and lymphatic malformation, don't you? But it's easy to call it a cavernous hemangioma. So we've dealt with those. And now we're coming on to a very interesting area. We've dealt with venous, lymphatic, venous, lymphatic. Let's look at arteriovenous malformations. Again, not tumors, been present in the patient all their life, an abnormal connection between the veins and the arteries. And essentially there's three types. You've got the low flow intracranial connections between arteries and veins or a fistula. That's the proper word for it. And then you've got the high flow intracranial connections. And that's called a carotico cavernous sinus fistula. And then you've actually got lesions in the orbit themselves 
that are AV malformations that can come on after two injuries, for example. So here's a patient. She actually came to me from India. I remember her very well. And she came and she was being seen by another doctor in some other third party country. And she was thought to have a little bit of thyroid eye disease because she had inflated uh, large episcleral vessels, as you see here, and a little bit of proptosis, not very much. And as I was looking at her and I was measuring her intraocular pressure, the Myers on the application tonometry was moving as if she had subtle pulse satility, very, very subtle. And she had a bit of disc swelling as well. And it was thought to be possible thyroid eye disease. But actually, when you do an M a CT scan, look at this large superior ophthalmic vein. This lady had all the classic features of a low flow intracranial so-called dural shunt, which is a shunt from the uh, meningeal vessels. And these snaky blood vessels were not inflammation. They were enlarged episcleral vessels. So here's the ultrasound. You can see the large superior ophthalmic vein. You put a gate on it. There's blood flow in it. And red means that there's blood flow coming towards the probe. Blood should not come towards the probe in a vein in the orbit. It should go away from the probe. But red tells you it's coming towards you. So there's arterialization. And it actually has an arterial waveform, as you see here. Very impressive. So these lesions have arterial waveforms. And we monitor them. Unless And we do not interfere unless the pressure is high. So here you see a, uh, a video showing the arterialization in the superior ophthalmic vein. Red means that the blood is coming towards the probe. It should always be blue and it shouldn't be arterialized, obviously. This is arterialized uh, and that just gets the diagnosis. You do not actually need to do a CT angiogram. A Doppler is absolutely fine. So that's the so-called low flow. Now, here's the more impressive and aggressive looking intracranial shunt called the high flow. And that's not from a middle, middle meningeal vessel. This is the carotid siphon itself rupturing to the cavernous sinus. It can be spontaneous or traumatic. And look at that degree of chemosis and ischemia. You get retinal ischemia. Uh, and these really do require intervention. The, the low flow ones do not usually require intervention, but these high flow ones do. And here you see balloon embolization. And that's the gold standard, because without that, uh, there's a, a huge risk of losing the eye and they will not close uh, spontaneously. And then we come on to arteriovenous malformations in the orbit itself. Now, arteriovenous malformations um, are congenital and there is some genetic background to it. And they belong to a, a family of, of abnormalities called the RAS, which is a gene, RASopathies. It's a germline mutation. And with that germline mutation, the patient has an increased risk of having these kind of AV malformations right through the body. So if you look at the picture on the left here, you've got a normal orderly sequence of affairs here, artery going into arterioles, going into capillaries, coming out into venules and going out into larger veins. That's normal, okay? You've got a, you've got a, a, a grade of pressure that goes through the tissues. But an AV malformation is like a Gordian knot of arteries and vessels without the, the, um, the capillary uh, interface here. Uh, and they, of course, can be problematic because they give a lot of pulsatility. And if they're around the orbit, they can be most uncomfortable to the patient. So here's one such patient. Now, small ones like this can actually be excised directly, fine. But what do we do about the large ones? Because they are more problematic. Let's look at a few of these together. First case, I've got three or four of these orbital AV malformations or communications. This patient here, in fact, he was from Pakistan. I remember him very well. Um, understandably, he'd seen a lot of eye doctors, but really nobody wanted to, 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 to operate because of the risk of, of hemorrhage. You can see the lesion here in the medial canthus. And it's not very deep, but it's all superficial. He had a terrible ache and a terrible pain. And it was very uncomfortable to him. It was a really achy eye with ptosis, as you see there. Um, so if you're fortunate, you hopefully get the, uh, you can see the pulsatility here. And it was like this all the time, 60 beats a minute, every single day of his life. It seemed to be getting worse. It was very achy and uncomfortable. I think that's what troubled him the most was the uh, discomfort from the ache. So if you look at the, um, the angiography, here you see real time by the internal carotid. Uh, you can see the, art, the ophthalmic artery lighting up here. We're still real time here. You can see the the, the clock down here, it's going through a phthalmic artery, internal, coming into the AV here, that's the nidus. And if you do the same thing from the external carotid, again, it's coming pretty quickly into the AV 
malformation and draining out to the facial artery there. And then if you, at the end, look at venous drainage, you can see that this is when it's all done. Uh, you can see that it's also shunting back out through the superior ophthalmic vein. There's a little bit in the choroid here. You can just make out the choroid and it's all shunting out into the facial vein. I'm just going to go back because it ran quite fast because I think it's a good series here. We just try and show you this again. So here you have external shooting out into the AV nidus there and then coming out into the facial artery. So these are difficult to treat because they often have internal and external carotid uh, feeds. Uh, and that's why they're very difficult to manage. So how do we do it? You can just excise them, of course, but that is high, high risk because you have a high, high pressure environment. So now the way these are treated uh, intracranially and elsewhere it's with some form of occlusion. The one we started with was called Glubran, 50% histoacral glue. It's literally a glue. It's not a sclerosant. And Lipiodial, this is a compound that enables you to see it on an X-ray. And here you see it being injected in, and it polymerizes. It goes hard like, like gel, uh, and it just blocks the whole thing off. So it doesn't cause any more trouble. And then it can either be left or it can be excised. But the point is, it's no longer active as a high-flow vascular abnormality. So here's a patient, uh, and this patient, uh, here you can see the envoy catheter, the same patient, the lesion's there, okay? We're using Glubran. We're going to inject it through a, a, a catheter. You can't see it. I'll show it to you now. There's the catheter. Very clever. This is all interventional radiology. Amazingly skilled colleagues and well worth getting to know and work with them because they'll teach you so many things as an oculoplastic surgeon. There's the catheter going in, goes all the way up here. Uh, they keep things clear with the IV heparin bolus, and then they inject the glue bran, okay? And this is the glue bran that's been injected. And some of it goes back down the system. There's a little bit going back there, not very much. Um, they tell me that that's where the retinal artery came off. So they're beyond that. They're going through that carotid. They're going into the ophthalmic. And they're going all the way here to get to this nidus. And what we're looking at here is the glue bran that has polymerized, which can then be excised, okay? A little bit of glue apparently escaping into the cavernous sinus. It's very, very amazing science, this, when you see it being done. But to the patient, it often some amazing advantages because you can then excise it. So here's the same patient. Now they had another angiogram after the embolization because before we excise it, we want to know that it has all been embolized. So is it embolized? Well, this is where it was. And there's minimal residual filling from the uh, contrast. This is a little bit of contrast, okay, in the choroid. There's not very much there. Uh, and uh, so there's so basically the lesion is no longer present. So that's after the embolization. So if you're going to remove it, now it's safe to remove it. But if it was still being fed, you have to make a decision as to whether it should be embolized once again. And I'll show you a case in a second. So here you see the patient, same patient, the gentleman from Pakistan, and we'd embolize it and it would all turn to glue or almost rubber. So we took it out. It actually did not bleed very much. The initial incision in the skin did, but then it didn't. We sent it to the pathologist, and the pathologist got straight back to us and said, we don't know what this is. It looks like rubber. We said, it is. It's polymerized glubrin. That's what it is. Uh, and what that does is it closes off that nidus. And the expectation is that it's, it's a cure. But it's not always a cure, because sometimes there might be other areas where the pressure builds up in a small part of the AV malformation that wasn't active at the time that you excised it. And there you see it being excised, and there he is early post-operative. He's done really well, actually, overall. He's, he's really looking good. Here we got him six months after surgery, and you can see it's not perfect, but he no longer has the weight and the throbbing, and, and he's grateful for what's been achieved. And will it come back? We don't know. Time will tell. What we've removed won't come back, but is there another area that will then enlarge? Now, here's a more difficult case. This gentleman, a really amazing patient person, very patient man, and, and there he is in 2006, and we, we decided not to intervene, but it was getting bigger. Another orbital AV malformation is getting larger, as you see on the bottom there. Uh, amazingly, he's still got perfect vision. He's got all this lesion around here, and occasionally it scabs over, and occasionally it even bleeds a bit sometimes, um, but really got pretty scabbed. And there's his X-ray, his CT scan, chiefly fairly anterior lesion, as you can see on that slide. Here it is again with uh, obviously it's taking up the contrast very early in the sequence because it's an AV malformation. And here you see the, uh, the, the channels, the vascular saccular channels within the lesion. So what do we do? Well, first of all, of course, angiography. What's the scale of the problem? And you can see again here, left internal carotid, that's internal. 
and on the right is external. So he's got two branches feeding in to this uh, AV malformation, two branches. So it really has to be closed effectively close to the nidus, but there's always going to be a risk that it reawakens later on. So we used the next uh, in the series of these polymerizing gels, and this one's called Onyx. And don't forget, these are different to the sclerosing agents that we talked about earlier on, because sclerosing agents irritate the internal lining of a vascular malformation like a lymphatics, but these are not sclerosants. These are actually just glues. They set, they block off. It's like filling the lesion with cement, but you fill them with a polymer. And the one that we used here was called Onyx. Now it's quite interesting this because Onyx um, is a copolymer uh, and it's got inside it tantalum powder. Tantalum, as you see here on the, you all know the periodic table. I'm sure you do. We'll test you on it later. But there's tantalum there. And tantalum comes from the name of a Greek god. And you just have to uh, uh, let me diverge a little bit here. Uh, tantalum uh, was a Greek god who was destined to stand in a pool of water here and never quite be able to reach the fruit above him for some sin or crime that he'd committed in heaven. And therefore, hence the term to be tantalized, to never be able to achieve something. Anyway, that term tantalized comes from this periodic uh, element called tantalum. And the point is that tantalum is in onyx because it enables you to see the where the polymer is. And it's considered to cause less trouble uh, than the previous version that I mentioned with the lipiodiol. So here is the patient who has now had his polymerization, and here you see him at surgery, all right? So there you see us taking out, it's black, and it's black because tantalum is black, black or gray. But you can get sparking from the diathermy to the tantalum. We didn't, but you can do. And here you see us, we've got a finger under the lid here, we're removing all this lesion, uh, and I was very, most fortunate uh, to be operating with Professor Jeffrey Rose at the time, uh, who has quite a lot of experience in this area uh, with these rare diseases. And here you see pre-op, and here he is post-op. And what's interesting, as I saw him in clinic again a few weeks later, this is a long time ago, but interestingly, I thought that he would reawaken and that it would get bigger and bigger. It's actually not got bigger. It's gone to sleep. It's, it's got a lot smaller after his one surgery, and he still maintains good vision of 6'9", six, six, I think, in that eye. Very interesting. Here he is that year, which was a few years ago, but he's looking better now today. Uh, and he's, he's comfortable. He's got a lot of hypoglobus. He's got a lot of asymmetry, but he's comfortable and he's got his vision with an uncurable condition, but at least it's controlled. Now, the next case, also using onyx, just to show you that it can be used for large and small. This is a patient who'd had a throbbing AVM right in the inner corner. And you can see after he's had his angiography and after he's had his embolization with onyx, you can see these like serpiginous worm-like structures. These are the very vessels that were pulsing before and are now are not pulsing because they're full of onyx. And you see it all being removed here. And this is a lovely incision, which I'm sure you're familiar with it. I call it the gull wing. So you're, you're coming along here in a crease. It could be a skin crease, but any crease. And then you do a back cut. And that back cut always heals beautifully. It's such a great approach for lesions that are just possibly a little bit too far medially for a skin crease. Maybe you could get this through a medial skin crease, but you're going to jeopardize potentially or compromise your access. So a little back cut works really, really nicely. Now, here's my last case. I'm saving the biggest to the last. This lady had had something in her lower lid all her life, but she was pregnant at this time and it was getting bigger through, through pregnancy, presumably driven by uh, the, uh, the hormones. And you see this massive lesion in the lower lid completely pushing this lid up, as you see there. And here's the, uh, here's the angiography. And there it is down the bottom there, this enormous lesion fed by the uh, internal and external carotid arteries. So that's the, uh, that's the view from the side, okay? And here is the axial view, and you see it laterally in the lower lid there. Amazing pictures, a huge lesion. Again, another very patient patient. And um, it really helps when they understand that you can't cure, but you can help. So she had her embolization, and then she came to see me with a view to having excised. And again, we were going to do this on one of our joint lists. Uh, but she actually said, look, in the last week or so, I've got more pulsatility. So I sent her back to our excellent interventional radiologist that we work with, our team. And she had a second embolization two weeks prior to surgery. And the question you may have is, when should you embolize? Well, at least a few weeks 
when should you operate at least a few weeks after the embolization? They used to say six, but in her case, we did it two weeks later because we didn't want it to come back again. And then we used the most recent iteration called fill. So we weren't using uh, onyx, we were using fill, precipitating hydrophilic injectable liquid, okay? And this is good because there's no tantal in a minute and there's no potential sparking. And it seems to be the best option at the moment now for closing these lesions. And so here you see her preambulization. That's the, that's the angiogram on the left. Here she's had injected the fill and that's the cast that you see here. And here she is at surgery. And what an operation it was removing this. I was relieved to find it did not bleed too much. We did this again as a joint case with my senior colleague, Jeff Rose, and uh, worked as a team and to get that out. And uh, I have to say it went, went really, really well. Very pleased with it. You can see it came out. We had a lot of extra skin to remove, having, having embolized it uh, up there. And, and early days, she was looking pretty good. She, she, she settled really well, actually. And that, and that hasn't come back. And this was about four, five, six years ago. Now it hasn't come back. Um, just shows you how effective these embolizing treatments can be. So to summarize that particular point with regard to orbital AVMs, they can occur spontaneously or follow, following mild injury or develop from some sort of pre-existing vascular anomaly. Currently, the polymer that is used by neurosurgeons chiefly and others is PHIL, all right? And that's now superseded Glubran and Onyx. And having closed them like that, they are, or at least the anterior ones, are readily accessible to excision. And how soon should you do the surgery after the embolization? Hard to say, but certainly one would have thought uh, two weeks and not much later than two, two months, because then it may reopen, you see. We're doing well. You're still with me. And we're coming towards the end. Just finally finishing off vascular malformations. I mentioned Flamius nevus. This is not a hemangioma. This is a congenital capillary malformation, not a capillary hemangioma, which grows. This does not grow. It's a capillary malformation in the skin, and it's named after that wine from Portugal called uh, port wine. That's why it's called the port wine stain, and it's most commonly on the face, and it persists throughout life. And you and I know as ophthalmologists that it can be part of sturge weber syndrome, and we have to be aware of the pressure in the eye. And as far as I know, apart from potentially some laser treatments, there is no other specific molecular treatment for any of these yet. So I want to come on to something pretty rare that we reported just recently, and it's also a vascular malformation. And this is called sinus pericranii. This lady came to us with a pulsatility in her upper lid without any trauma. And she leant forwards, it didn't get bigger. So it wasn't a vascular, mal it wasn't a venous malformation, but it was some sort of pulsatility in the lid and her retinal blood vessels were dilated, but she could see normally. And here you see the video and you might just be able to make out there's a subtle pulsatility here. Can you see that? Subtle pulsatility here, a bit of pulse, big, big blood vessels around there. She had a very rare condition where the sagittal sinus comes through a hole in the bone spontaneous and drains into the facial veins. Uh, and so here's an ultrasound of what we've just seen in the eyelid. You've got these large vessels with the Doppler showing an extraordinary Doppler waveform that I can't interpret. And she had a very rare condition, which you may have heard of, and you might come across, called sinus pericranii, where you get this defect in the bone of the skull here. No injury in her case. It was spontaneous. Or how long it had been there, we don't know. Where you get the sagittal sinus draining through, the veins draining into the facial vasculature, as you, show, as you see here. And it's difficult to know how to treat these. Here's the contrast medium that's been injected into the left internal carotid artery, that gets into the sagittal sinus. Sagittal sinus comes through that defect I just shown you, comes into the facial veins here, and then down into the around the eyelid, which she was aware of. And so these are rather unusual. I mentioned that because we'd seen them and, and we published it because we, we we hadn't we didn't know much about it. It was absolutely fascinating working with the same interventional radiology team. Uh, usually they're asymptomatic, but sometimes they can get vertigo and dizziness due to the venous pressure, and the optimal management is not known. But like all things in life if uncertain, be conservative. Because if this vein is taking most of the drainage from the, from the sagittal sinus, and if, you, and if you block it, obviously there's going to be potential problems with intracranial hypertension or venous hypertension. So the management decision, monitor, always wiser. She wasn't too troubled, uh, and we're just monitoring her for the moment. Coming on now, just really just a couple more slides. 
rare vascular tumors. They're very rare, so there's very little to say about them. Kaposiform hemangioendothelioma, a very rare vascular neoplasm diagnosed in infancy, and it can be locally quite aggressive. And there you see an example. I personally have not seen a kaposiform hemangioendothelioma. The other one that's described that I think is probably more SFT type these days is called a hemangiopericytoma, but all of these soft tissue lesions have, are being reclassified, and many of them now fall into that ca uh, category called solitary fibrous tumor. But the point is, it is a soft tissue lesion that can have a lot of vessels within it, and these need to be monitored, and if they are removed, they need to be removed intact because of the risk of them recurring. So if there's one thing that you want to remember about solitary fibrous tumor is that they will recur uh, in, and if they're not removed completely, they have a high chance of recurring. But that's another story for another day, perhaps. And then finally, you're still with me coming on, I'm afraid we're all getting older. As we get older, our vessels get older. And if our vessels get older, they can rupture spontaneously. And the risks, including age, of course, are anybody on antiplatelets like aspirin or diabetes, blood pressure, and it often happens when they wake up or if they cough. And usually we manage them conservatively, except unless they come with an enormous pressure. And here's another one, a bit like that last one I showed you, bleed number one. And then on top of that, bleed number two, you can see it nicely on this uh, MRI scan. And here's the lady, vision was going down with an early RAPD and we simply drained it. And you can see here, and vision came back. Most of the time, they don't need draining, but when the pressure's going up, and they've got an RAPD, give strong thought to draining it, aspirating it, uh, and that aspirates all the blood. So I'm going to finish with a bit of a paradox. We spent to this afternoon, this evening, talking about vena, of, of vascular malformations of the orbit. And if you're a young trainee, you might think, surely it's blood vessels, they have a high risk of hemorrhage. Is my patient going to have a serious hemorrhage? And there's a bit of a paradox here I'd like to finish on. The most commonly ones, common ones that can bleed are those that have a very low blood flow through them. You'd think that the ones that would bleed would be the ones with a high blood flow, but the venous lymphatic malformations with a sluggish flow are the ones commonly to have a bleed. Very rarely do the high flow carotico-cavernous fistulae bleed, and very rarely do any of these intracranial ones or ones around the orbit actually bleed despite the fact they have a high flow. Vascular neoplastic lesions virtually never bleed, and really never one, the ones that bleed are the low flow dural arteriovenous shunts. Remember, those are the patients who have those snaky vessels on the front of the eye. And so that is a paradox because you might think the high, high pressure lesions would be the ones that would be more likely to bleed, but that's not the case. It's the venous lymphatic ones that can bleed and they can bleed again and again. And that's why they're problematic. And that's why there's so much emphasis given to sclerotherapy. Uh, to close off the lymphatic malformations if they keep bleeding into their into their internal contents. So I'm going to finish on this slide. Um, and I hope you found this helpful. It is a difficult area. Orbital vascular lesions. Uh, we looked at the hemangiomas, that's the capillary hemangiomas, as well as the interosseous hemangiomas. We've looked at the vascular malformations, which can be venous, venous lymphatic, lymphatic, and then the arterial venous malformations. Now that includes the orbital ones, and I showed you a few cases there of how we remove them after we polymerize them. Then I mentioned just two very rare vascular tumors, which are so rare, I just put them in for completeness sake, and there are probably one or two others. And then finally, what happens to old vessels when patients cough or they have a high pressure, and what should we do about them? So I've tried to cover this very difficult area in a fairly short period of time. I hope you found this talk interesting. Um, I'll try to answer any questions that you've got, but we're all learning and I don't have all the answers. Uh, but I do think that having a simple structure in your mind when you approach these patients uh, is helpful. Thank you very much indeed for your attention. And uh, I think I've taken up my 60 minutes and I'll stop sharing my screen just now. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, so you, Dr. Verity. I think this was one of the most beautiful classes of iFocus. Uh, you simplified this complicated topic so much for us. Uh, we really enjoyed your lecture. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, we do have a few questions for this uh, talk. Uh, with your kind permission, may we just proceed with the questions? Please. Uh, the One of the viewers has asked, is how do we differentiate uh, between a micro and a macrocystic lymphangioma and how different is our approach in these cases? 
Yeah, well, that that is difficult. I think you've got to go with you've got to go with ultrasound, really. Uh, and the macro cysts are more amenable to bleomycin. Uh, and that is where I very much defer to our, our vascular colleagues. If you work in a big unit, you might actually have a, a, a pediatric vascular unit that you talk to. But it's really all about the ultrasonography that will give you the size of it. Um, and, and knowing that it's purely lymphatic and it's not venous because you cannot treat the the venous ones, or if there's an arterial component with any of these sclero sclerotherapy agents. And I, I mentioned at the beginning of my slide, I personally don't have a lot of experience in those because we very much defer to our pediatric colleagues, but it's all in the ultrasonography and in the MRI. Of course, in a young person, you don't do CTs if you can help it, uh, but it's in, the, it's in the imaging to help you determine. And of course, there's often a mixture between both, between both macro and micro. So it's not the best answer, I'm afraid there, but it's about the imaging and being sure that you're dealing only with a lymphatic malformation and not a venous lymphatic malformation. All right. Uh, in a question uh, which pertains to cavernous hemangioma, confined to the intraconal space and very pretty close to the optic nerve, how do, uh, should we choose our surgical options? One is, uh, do we do an orbitotomy with an excision biopsy attempt or do we consider a low-dose radiation for the same? So, the, the, yeah, the question is, when do, you, when do you go in and remove it? And when can you use radiotherapy? And when should you use radiotherapy? So for the really big ones in the intraconal space that are, in, are encountered coincidentally, you don't know how long they've been there. They may have been there for months, years maybe. You can monitor them. But when there's clearly evidence of a change, it becomes a trade-off with the risks of it continuing to get bigger and compressing the optic nerve versus the risks of surgery itself. And that's a discussion with each patient. And I've got a, a doctor colleague at the moment. I have this discussion every time he sees us every six months. And he's a urological colleague, but he's still got his 6'6", and he's still got his colors. And so you treat the patient, not the scan. But when you really are this, when you have, when you've got to the point where you know you're going to remove it, the approach is really, it's, it's, it's one of the, it's usually an upper lid skin crease or a lower lid swing approach. And when you get to the lesion, there are various things you can do, but what you want to do is to compress it away from the optic nerve and you want to get hold of it. You can either use a cryoprobe or you can use a, a hemostat or an artery clip. And whatever you do, you're aiming to effectively decompress it away from the optic nerve onto a safe area, bone. Because the more you compress it, it actually loses its size quite a lot. And because radiologically, you know you're dealing with a cavernous hemangioma or possibly a solitary fibrous tumor, you're not going to take it away piecemeal. But often in one's mind, you think, well, maybe if I just debulked it, I'm going to take it away. I'm going to take the pressure off and the patient's okay. But by the time you've got there, debulking it isn't necessarily any less work than actually holding it and taking it away from the optic nerve and compressing it. Because And you can put a needle in it, a big bore needle, and you can put some suction on it with a syringe, anything to reduce its size. Because once you've reduced its size, it gets then slightly easier to remove. Now, some of them, you know, they just come out really easily, don't they? And some of them have got a really fibrotic surface around them and they can be really, really hard work. And so the patient needs to know, you know, there is a small, but there's a realistic chance of loss of vision or diplocular or what have you. But the key message I that I understand is when you've got to it, compress it away from the nerve, decompress it, reduce it in its size and remove it intact. What you don't do is go there and just remove half of it because if it turns out it's a solitary fibrous tumor, then you're in trouble. And they can be solitary fibrous tumors when you thought that they were going to be cavernous hemangiomas when you started. So it's a difficult area. And that's a that's an area for a whole new talk, I'm afraid. Next time, maybe. Yes. Uh, also, intraoperatively, uh, whenever we are considering an excision biopsy of an intraconal mass, particularly, let us say, a cavernous hemangioma, uh, dilatation of the pupil, is it a surrogate marker of compression of the optic nerve per se? Or is it an excessive pressure on the globe using a malleable retractor or a paddle, um, uh, like uh, just to, uh, on the globe? So is it true, uh, in a true sense, is it a compression of the optic nerve you're looking at with the dilatation of the pupil? Or is it something else? Uh, it, 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 it could be nerve or it could be, it could be the, so the ciliary nerves as well. That's another option. I've certainly seen patients that I, a patient that I was decompressing for swenoidine meningioma and if you put enough pressure on the nerves there, the nerve to the pupil, then, of course, you're going to get a dilated pupil because pupil pupillary dilation is not second nerve, it's third nerve, obviously. So it's a proxy marker that you don't want to see. And so if you do see it, you just take the pressure off. Uh, whether you're compressing the 
the nerve per se, you're more likely to be compressing the tissues and the ciliary ganglion and the ciliary nerves because they're the ones that have the third cranial nerve input to the pupil um, in you know, optic nerve compression per se, not per se gives you a dilated pupil. It's the third nerve that does that. But when you see it, basically you're talking about an orbit under pressure. And when you see it, you take all the pressure off. You, you, you just take your instruments out. So when you're operating as an orbital surgeon, every time you're not actually doing anything, you're subtly taking that pressure off because all the time you're putting pressure up uh, in the orbit. And I can tell you the most frightening time I had was a lady with sphenoid meningioma. I was doing the medial wall decompression. It was going really well. I was doing it for optic neuropathy. And halfway through the, the procedure, the pupil blew. It went massive. I was so frightened. And I presumed that I'd caused some damage to the optic nerve. But what I'd been doing was with my malleable in the medial orbit was putting pressure against the ciliary nerves because the sphenoid wing meningioma was pushing the lateral orbit in, which I wasn't operating there. And I took the pressure off and it took three or four months to get better. But mercifully, when she came around after the general anesthetic, her vision was normal, but she had a dilated pupil. So that was a classic example of probably pressure on the ciliary nerves. But essentially, that's what you, what you said is very important. You've got to look at the... And you've got to look at the eye and you've got to look at the pupil as you're operating all the time. You must never occlude the pupil while you're operating because it is a proxy for high pressure. Also, you mentioned in one of the uh, slides the use of doxycycline. So we would uh, like to know what would be the dose of doxycycline uh, management? What would those? I'd have, I'm afraid I would have to go and ask someone. I do not know. I do not use it. Doxycycline is used as an antibiotic. Uh, it's used as an anti-lymphoma agent. Uh, and it's used as 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 it's used in lymph. In, I, I do have the dose, and I can and I can tell somebody later. The slide that I made was a slide shortened from a much bigger slide that I've got that had absolutely um, every dose on. And in fact, as since it's on one of my hidden slides, I probably can tell you doxycycline, ten to twenty milligrams per kilogram. There you go. There's the answer. Ten to twenty milligrams per kilogram of doxycycline. I hope that's useful to your your your, your inquirer. Uh, thank you so much, sir. And that's all we have uh, for today's lecture. And before we conclude, I have a small announcement to make. We meet next on the 24th of January for another international masterclass, the topic being lymphoproliferative tumors of the orphan by Dr. Stephen. We see you there.